Hi, and welcome to our session, Making It Easier to Make Things with WebAssembly and the Internet of Things. There'll be two of us presenting today. My name is Jonathan Barry. I'm the CEO of Goliath, an IoT platform company. I'm joined by my good friend, Alvaro. Hello, everyone. My name is Alvaro. I'm a Google Developer Expert for IoT and also work as a software engineer at Leverage, working on IoT projects there. You'll be hearing from Alvaro later today. Now, let's talk about our agenda. Uh, four major sections. We'll start with defining what is WebAssembly, or WASM, as we'll use it interchangeably. Then we'll move on to how WebAssembly has moved beyond the browser. And next, we'll be talking about the meat of this conversation, which is WebAssembly and IoT, a great combination. And the last part of the talk, we'll be showing you code. All right, let's get into it. So what is WebAssembly? If we go to WebAssembly.org, uh, the main website for the specification, you'll see this definition. I'm going to highlight a few key points. Basically, WebAssembly is an instruction format, like an ISA, uh, to be run in a specialized virtual machine. And that means that you can take languages that can compile to WebAssembly and run it in that, in that environment. Um, and the first use case is really focusing on the web, hence the name. And with that definition comes some goals. And, and first, the, the most well-known goal of WebAssembly is to be fast and efficient, because it's not just important to have a, a compile target in a VM, but it needs to be able to be efficient for, let's say, the browser. Um, and it needs to be more efficient than things like JavaScript and other virtual machine technologies before it. The second goal is to be safe, and that also means security. And uh, just like the web has some basic constructs for safety and security, like tab isolation, WebAssembly has to support those as well. And in some parts of WebAssembly, they try to even increase uh, safety and security. The third goal is being open and debuggable. And that's really about uh, enabling developers to build complicated applications with WebAssembly, but also to have room to experiment and grow and uh, evolve the specification. The last goal is being part of the open web platform. And that's about not just being able to execute code in a VM, but to interact with its environment, to interface with, in this case, the web platform like JavaScript APIs and, and browser capabilities. Since we're talking about browsers, uh, WebAssembly on the web has broad browser adoption. It's actually been supported by every major web browser for quite some time. And what's notable about WebAssembly as a standard is that it's one of the few that got unified uh, across the browser vendors uh, it, all at once. Um, actually, Microsoft, uh, Google, Mozilla, and Apple all contributed to the original uh, founding specification. So there's so something special about WebAssembly uh, from its early beginnings. Now, there's a broad adoption because of those browser support, and you'll find hundreds of, of examples on the internet. Uh, I tend to bucket into four major categories, and here's just some examples from those major categories. Uh, so I'll go through them quickly. Um, the most uh, common use case for using WebAssembly on the web is uh, for games, and, and game engines support compiling to uh, WebAssembly. And so as a game developer, you can build your, your game using the platform uh, of your choice, uh, targeting mobile or desktop or console, and then also get a web app uh, pretty much uh, for free, which has uh, been one of the early success stories of WebAssembly. Second large category <clears throat> is taking legacy desktop applications uh, that, you, that was written with millions of lines of uh, probably C++ code and porting that to the web uh, similar to game engines. And there, there's a success story um, with Autodesk and AutoCAD where they basically took their you know, 30 year old application and now they have a web app. And as they continue to develop AutoCAD, uh, they get that web app um, with all the greatest, latest and greatest features. And they didn't have to build a purpose built web app as well. And it was, it was almost uh, they got that web app for free. <clears throat> the next category, one that I think uh, is the most relevant and useful role of WebAssembly at large is to take it and apply it almost like a scalpel to improve specific areas of web applications where performance or security is critical. And let's say JavaScript can't meet those, those, those performance needs. So one example is Figma, which is a web-based uh, visual design tool. They use WebAssembly for their layout engine, very computationally intensive. Um, and another example is eBay. They have a QR code scanner, uh, and they need that, that speed that JavaScript just couldn't give. And the last category I want to touch on is code reuse. And that's not quite the same as 
porting a desktop library, but actually taking, let's say, a module library that might be complicated um, and compile it to WebAssembly so you can use it in different environments. Uh, there's, there's a write-up from the Google Earth team of how they have a very sophisticated rendering engine that they want to reuse between the web and mobile. And through WebAssembly, they can compile their, their desktop uh, <clears throat> library and bring it into the web and then build a bes you know, native uh, natural you know, web-based application around it. So let's talk about WebAssembly beyond the browser. Um, now, the creators of WebAssembly, while they chose the name to, uh, web, uh, thought about the use cases that might be relevant uh, beyond just um, beyond this, the browser. And in fact, if you go to the WebAssembly website, you'll see a whole section about non-web embeddings. And they talk about how the same goals of WebAssembly could be applied to other uh, environments. And uh, they did they they actually split up the spec to have a core spec, which is about the, the compilation target, low-level primitives of of, of the, the spec, and then the JavaScript bindings to separate that out, so that in the future other bindings can be brought in as as they become relevant. And uh, some of these use cases are cloud computing, where we have traditional virtual machines. Maybe you could replace that with, with WebAssembly. Blockchain, which runs third-party code on top of a blockchain stack. Uh, tooling and CLIs, which have pretty bespoke implementation requirements. And the thing that we're interested in the most, which is the Internet of Things. Uh, and by the way, whenever you see a cartoon that's bluish like this in my slides, uh, that's credit to Lynn Clark over at Mozilla Research. She does a fantastic job taking deeply complicated specs and making them accessible uh, to developers like ourselves. And uh, actually, WebAssembly is being adopted beyond the browser. Um, there's a, a handful of, of categories of use cases that I'll, I'll go through some of them now. Um, you know, cloud is probably the most uh, interesting and first to come on the scene. Uh, that's everything from Cloudflare and Flastly and even Microsoft taking traditional server workloads and running it uh, in a WebAssembly VM, um, or even extending the cloud. Uh, projects like Envoy, which is a popular uh, proxy, uh, can be extended and create new functionality using using WebAssembly. And then there's blockchain. And I think it really got started when the Ethereum Foundation said that they're going to take their proprietary bespoke EVM, Ethereum VM, and move it to a WebAssembly-based implementation. And a ton of other projects started to follow suit as well. A lot of activity in the, in the blockchain world with WebAssembly. Of course, to run it outside the browser, you need runtimes that can run beyond the browser. Uh, and there's a, a, an array of, of different types of runtimes with different characteristics, um, some optimized for, for cloud-based, some of them for IoT. And we'll go into some of those later. Uh, and the last uh, category I want to talk about is languages themselves. And that's not to say taking an, one language and compiling it to WebAssembly and running it somewhere, but actually extending the capability of the language itself. So Node, uh, Node.js, for example, has the ability to pull in WebAssembly uh, modules, first-class support, and add new capabilities to Node without having to deal with uh, native bindings and cross-compilation challenges. And, and by the way, other languages can be uh, extended in the same way with WebAssembly just through a third-party extension framework. Now, this is all about running code, and it's the VM part of WebAssembly. But uh, in all these use cases, there is there needs to be some interaction with the host environment, with the server, serving infrastructure, with the blockchain, etc. And uh, there needs to be some interface to be defined to have that interaction. And that's, uh, that's called WASI, the WebAssembly System Interface. And it's a spec and a work stream to define what those interfaces should look like. And that's a whole uh, talk in and of itself. But this is a key piece to the WebAssembly story. Um, and actually, a noble quote is from Solomon Hikes, uh, who is the creator of Docker. And he said that if WASM and WASI existed, uh, prior to 2008, they probably wouldn't have to have created Docker. And so uh, there's a lot to be um, a lot to be a lot to be done here. But it's super interesting that uh, that's so powerful. And like I mentioned, it's a whole other topic, and we don't have time for that. But it, you can think of WASI as an API contract between the WebAssembly runtime and wherever it's running and the environment you're trying to, to work at. So there's a WASI core, which has some of these interfaces defined for things like file system networking. And the community is then expanding upon and proposing new use cases. Blockchain folks are talking about smart contracts, VR, 3D graphics, et cetera. And so this is one area that is under active development and actually an opportunity to, to come in and be part of, of the story. Now to the meat of what we're here to talk about, WebAssembly and IoT. And before we get into the details, 
Um, I want to start just to define what is uh, IoT or the Internet of Things. When we talk about machines and computers with connectivity, we think of smartphones, laptops, and servers. But when, when we say IoT, we, we don't mean these kinds of things. We mean more like these kind of things. So door locks, digital assistants, medical devices, signage. And effectively, uh, I would categorize those as traditional embedded systems. And the main difference between an embedded system and maybe a general purpose computing platform is that the embedded systems really have constraints. And we call these environments constrained environments or constrained devices. And that's everything from its processing power and its computing capabilities to other resources on the device. And then just as a point of comparison, the, the machine you're probably watching this on has multiple cores with gigahertz of compute power, where your traditional IoT device might have 64 megahertz on a single core, maybe 128 kilobytes of RAM, half a mega flash. It also extends to uh, power and power usage. So if it's a battery powered device, it might be running two hours, uh, two, sorry, two years on a single AA. Even its networking might be constrained, so only 50 kilobytes per second for upload speeds. And so to build systems with IoT devices uh, with all these constraints, you actually have to have very specialized software, um, custom networking stacks, et cetera. And it's, uh, it requires a, a very specialized skill set. And so whenever I talk about IoT devices and meet a developer who's interested in the space, the, the first question I usually get is, can I run JavaScript on an Arduino or an IoT device more generally? And uh, I think it's a reasonable question. They, they come from that, that world and that experience. They have those tools. And I attribute this a lot to, uh, to Atwood's law. And uh, Jeff Atwood, famous software developer, coined this phrase, uh, any application that can be written in JavaScript will eventually be written in JavaScript. And, and to me, that's really about a, a software platform where there's an influx of, of new developers. They are always looking for some level of abstraction. And in the uh, IoT world, that's, that's certainly the case. Um, and there's a whole bunch of folks working on specialized implementations that can be run in constrained environments. And in fact, there are multiple implementations of JavaScript runtimes that can work on microcontroller devices. And there are implementations in other languages that can run on uh, constrained devices. Now, the big challenge with these is, besides being hard to make, there's no room for code reuse. And because each language needs to support a, a array of devices, all the work to make MicroPython, for example, work uh, on our Arduino class devices uh, can't be used in JavaScript, the JavaScript implementation. And as you build libraries to talk to sensors and other devices, those too cannot be used uh, and reused. And so a lot of us start to ask the question, well, can we use WebAssembly potentially to create an abstract layer? So there's some common low-level implementation that we can all share, and each language can build on top of it. And if you reflect back on to the, the goals of Web, WebAssembly in general, they apply really well to IoT devices. Remember, these are constrained devices. so. WebAssembly being efficient really helps out here. Uh, safety and security, that's a critical part of, of some of these mission critical devices. Uh, being open and debuggable would allow us to create the complicated uh, IoT uh, software, but also extend it to all the different use cases that might come up. And really, the only difference is not just supporting the web ecosystem, but also the hardware ecosystem. And in fact, that's what's being done today. And it's not just theory. Uh, it's, it's really something you can grab uh, with your own projects. And actually, for the rest of this talk, we'll be talking through how you can start using WebAssembly with IoT devices. From here, I'll hand it over to Alvaro to give us all the details. Hello, everyone. So I'm here to show you a quick little demo of using WebAssembly uh, to run multiple high-level languages on an IoT device. So the approach that we are going to show here is more like an extension approach. So as we are going to see, uh, we are not like fully replacing all the like embedded system development with WebAssembly because the devices still have to provide like device drivers, networking and memory management. So uh, we are going to like handle most of the logic of the system using WebAssembly, but st we still need to implement some things on the device itself. So this is how it's going to work. So we are going to get like three languages, in this case, TinyGo, AssemblyScript, and Rust. We are going to compile to AssemblyScript, and the device that we chose is an ESP32, and it is providing an OTA interface that basically we can post WebAssembly files to it. Uh, it is going to save on the device uh, internal flash, 
and then every time the device reboots, it's going to like run that web WebAssembly file using the WebAssembly runtime. In this case, we are using the WASM3 library. And then for that runtime to work uh, and provide the interfaces and uh, access to the underlying things on the ESP32, we need to implement a bridge to have access to GPIO, memory, and Wi-Fi connections. So we are going to show that uh, how it works. But first, let's go through the demo and I'm going to show the code and uh, sending some code to, to the device itself. Cool. So here I have my device already running uh, assembly script uh, and also it's like blinking in an LED here having access to the device pins and connecting to connected to Wi-Fi. Uh, this here is the assembly script uh, code. Uh, it looks a lot like uh, an Arduino code but in this case of course it's written in, um, in a like flavor of TypeScript. Uh, but assembly script is actually like a smaller subset because it compiles to this like more low level thing, uh, which is uh, web assembly. But the code basically does have some functions to connect to Wi-Fi, check if it is connected or not, connect to a given SSID and password, retry, uh, print the local IP address. Uh, we have like a setup function that set up those pins to output so I can toggle the LED on and off. And we have our like uh, normal loop function that we usually have on our uh, some of our Arduino code and prototypes to do something on a loop. In this case, it's just blinking an LED and printing some messages. So we are going to compile the assembly script code here. Let me enter the folder here. I'm gonna delete the old uh, code, and then I'm gonna run the npm script here that uses the assembly script uh, commands to compile the, the code that we are seeing here. Oh, actually, to show that it's different, let's uh, change the message here. Like, hello, open source uh, summit, uh, Europe, Europe 2020 in assembly script. Let's compile. So let's see the WebAssembly file size. So in this case, for the assembly script uh, code, compile is just like four uh, kilobytes, so it's pretty small. If you think about, because when you have to do like a full OTA on a DSP32 device, for example, it usually takes like one megabyte uh, for a full code. So let's update the device. So we have like a HTTP interface on it, so we can post some uh, post the file to it, and it's also using MDNS, so we don't need to type in the IP address. So I'm gonna call that file, and after the device receives that file, it's gonna reboot. So yeah, it's rebooting now. And yeah, it's now running uh, the new code. So it's connecting to Wi-Fi, getting the IP address, and printing out the new message. And let's do that with another language. Let's get now TinyGo. Uh, and let me open the TinyGo code here. So it's the same logic. We just written the same code, but in different language. This case is Go. So it's connecting to Wi-Fi, set up the uh, GPIOs, and our loop function just checks the Wi-Fi uh, connection and prints the local IP address, but in this case it's hello tiny go. So I'm gonna remove the old file and let's run my build script here, just using tiny go to compile it to WebAssembly. And in this case, the uh, WebAssembly file is much bigger, probably because the tiny go compiler is not as optimized for the WebAssembly world, but it's still like uh, super small, it's just like eight kilobytes. So let's send the OTA to the device. Same thing, the device is going to receive that file uh, and after it saves, it's going to reboot running the new code. Okay, load N, rebooting, hello from tiny go. And it's doing the same thing, connecting to Wi-Fi, getting the IP address and such and such. And now last one, let's do uh, for Rust. Let me delete the old file and let's run my build script here. In this case for Rust, uh, the actual compile code is super small, like the Rust compiler is super optimized. Um, so it generates like a really small code, so it's just one kilobyte. So we are going to OTA that to the device again. Uh, let me show the Rust code here, it's the same thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, connecting to Wi-Fi and running the loop as we presented before. And yeah, it's now running Rust. Um, 
Cool. So another cool thing about WebAssembly that we talked before is that it opens uh, the possibilities to making like some debugging or even simulation tools uh, because it's more like in a standard way uh, of doing things. And for example, we can actually uh, implement the same APIs that the device is implemented on the web. And then we can run those same WebAssembly files uh, to be simulated on the web. So let me show that to you. So I'm gonna start my server here. And there you go. This is the, the same, uh, this is the web interface that is simulating uh, the same APIs that is provided by the device. In this case, it's running the assembly script code, it's connecting to the uh, Wi-Fi network. Uh, and I mean, I'm providing APIs for serial console. In this case, it's just bringing to an uh, element here on the DOM. And for example, I can simulate that the IP address is different. For example, it ends with 10. And then I can change to run the Rust code. And then it's going to get like this simulated IP address, but still connecting to the same Wi Fi interface. And I can test like the tiny go code, uh, etc. So, yeah, that's a nice thing. So maybe we can have like some debugging tools uh, for that. So we can simulate the actual hardware, like blinking the LED or maybe connecting to other things if we build those interfaces. Cool, so back to the slides here. Let's show how this works uh, under the hood. So basically we need to build that bridge between the WebAssembly world and the IoT and the embedded system world. So we need to implement that glue to make both uh, work together. So right now there's no standard way to, to build that yet. So we had to define our own contract to make that work. So how we define an interface or contract to make that work. So first we need to define which functions are going to be implemented by the hardware side. Those functions are known as the exporting functions. So basically, for example, if I want to make GPIO available or Wi-Fi interface available, I need to define those methods that are gonna be available for the WebAssembly world to use. And those functions are going to be implemented in C and C++ because we are talking about the hosted the embedded system side. And for the high level language, like we presented with Rust, TinyGo, and AssemblyScript, those functions are going to be imported or external functions. So basically they're just gonna be used uh, by those high level language. They don't need like extra uh, implementation. Although we are going to talk about some complex types handling, but most of the work is, is on the embedded system side. And the cool thing is after we define those interfaces and implement them on the hardware side, other languages that, that have targets for WebAssembly can be used um, and use those external functions later. So for example, we didn't present here C++, but C++ also can be compiled to WebAssembly and C++ uh, can also use those functions uh, in this scenario. So this is uh, our pseudo contract. I'm just showing this to, to give an idea. Think of that as a protocol buffer type of definition. Uh, maybe this can generate some code. In this case, it's not doing, but it's just to present the whole idea on how we define the contract to make those two work. So uh, basically we define three modules. The first one is just the Arduino module that have like the mealless function that returns kind of the uptime of the system, a delay function that receives uh, some milliseconds to like sleep for a while uh, or just stop a bit. Uh, pin configuration, GPIO configuration, toggle uh, those pins. And also uh, I added a function to return like uh, maybe an internal uh, LED configuration on a pin that is the default pin to, to be toggle here. Uh, we have a serial interface and the Wi-Fi interface that we can have like the status, connect to Wi-Fi and get the local IP. And as you can see here, and also as a reminder, WebAssembly is a low level uh, thing. So they only provide you like basic types. So we only have numbers and pointers. So for example, for the Wi-Fi connection function, we need to, to pass strings for the SSID and password, but we don't have that. So we have to pass like a pointer to a byte buffer and that buffer uh, is filled with like a given size and the password is the same thing. We're passing a pointer and the size of that uh, buffer. And for the local YP, although it returns a string, we don't have a way to return a string by itself. We just pass a pointer that is a buffer that's gonna be filled out by the host OS, like by the ESP32 in this case. And then on the, the high level language, we can have access to that. I'm gonna show how this is implemented on, on both sides. So this is uh, the definitions of those functions on the WASMI tree uh, world or, or on the ESP32 side in this case. So we are just declaring here the modules, like the Arduino modules, the functions, 
And also this library have this cool notation that you define uh, like the return method of those functions and also the parameters. So for example, the millisecond functions here uh, returns a number and they uh, have no parameters. The delay function uh, returns void, doesn't return anything, but receives a number as a parameter. And we have more complex examples like the Wi-Fi connect uh, function that doesn't return anything, but receives a pointer and a number, a pointer and a number, which is the SSID and password pointers that we are going to pass to the strings later. And for the actual implementation of those functions, here's the basic example of the system of time or the millis uh, function. Uh, we just declared the return type, which is a number. And then we call the uh, millis function for the Arduino framework, for, for example, in this case here. For the GPIO implementation, uh, we also have a way to get like parameters that are coming from the, the high level language or the thing that was compiled to WebAssembly. So in this case, we're seeing two parameters, the pin number and the value, and we just call the digital write function of the Arduino framework. And as we are not returning anything, we just call the function to success. And on the high level language, in this case is assembly script, we just declared our functions that are coming from the host thing that this is going to run. So in this case, I'm just uh, getting, uh, importing those functions that are already implemented on the device itself. So for the assembly script world, those functions already exist, I just use them. But for more complex uh, examples, like the Wi-Fi connection, that we need to pass strings. Like I said, we don't have strings natively. So in this case, uh, the arguments are going to be like um, points, uh, pointers for like memory uh, spaces on that device. So we receive like the pointer to the SSID, the size of the SSID, uh, pointer to the password, and the size of the password. And then we convert that to a string and then we call the Wi-Fi function on the Arduino framework to connect to Wi-Fi. And then, again, this function doesn't return anything, we just call success. And on the high-level language side, again, showing assembly script. Uh, although assembly script supports the strings, uh, as we talk, uh, there's no support for that uh, on the WASMI word, so we need to do the conversion between the strings and the byte buffers. So in this case, on the assembly script, I need to convert to UTF-8 and code into a byte array get the length, and then pass the, those pointers to the underlying uh, WASMI word here. And the same thing for the local IP, in this case, the host OS is returning the string, so we need to like allocate some memory, pass that pointer to the host OS, and then that host OS is gonna fill out with the local IP in this case, and then we convert back to a string. So to summarize, we need to define an interface and a contract with those methods that are going to be uh, used uh, on our use case. Uh, we need to implement that contract on the host, so most of the work uh, right now is to, to implement that on the host system, in the embedded system. And we need to always like remember that we need to handle like those complex types and we need to do some, uh, some allocation and memory management because WebAssembly only defines basic types, so we only have numbers uh, and pointers. So yeah, I mean, what is the future for WebAssembly and IoT? The thing that I just presented here and the not so good news is uh, someone has to build those bridges. So we as a community need to define more standard ways to like bridge, uh, make bridges between WebAssembly and IoT. And as we talked before, maybe WASI is the solution, but right now WASI is defining more things for more common use cases like file system access, um, crypto APIs and those kind of things. But for the IoT world, we need more than that. So we need access to GPIOs, networking that can be Wi-Fi, Ethernet, BLE, uh, or other types of uh, hardware access. And also, for example, for IoT, maybe we need a uh, thing for power management, which is really specific for IoT, and a lot of uh, use cases need that. So yeah, we need to define those standard ways to access that. And the cool thing is that we have some really good uh, RTOS and embedded system projects that are trying to standardize uh, those layers to support multiple devices, but they are doing on the like embedded world is still like C and C++. And a really good example of that is like Zephyr RTOS. So maybe what we can do is uh, build some layers on top of those good abstractions for multiple devices. So maybe building something on top of Zephyr, for example, and uh, leverage the, those really good APIs that they are creating. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's something that we can uh, discuss and maybe use. And one uh, good example of a company that is building uh, some set of 
interface and APIs uh, to do that with WebAssembly is, in, is Intel. They have something called Rammer Application Framework that they, they, find, they define some interfaces, contracts like we did here, uh, how to build applications using WebAssembly for IoT. But they define it uh, not, so, so, uh, not so standard way, those interfaces, but they have that an example and you can check later with some of the links that we are going to make available here. But yeah, we are excited with the future of WebAssembly and IoT. Uh, there are still a lot of things to do and uh, things to be standardized and maybe APIs to be written. So we invite you all to join this cause and maybe uh, help us make things be, uh, easier to build using WebAssembly and IoT. And as I mentioned before, here are some links about WebAssembly in general, like the webassembly.org and wowsy.dev for the wowsy spec. Uh, we have the Discord channel that uh, you can follow like some things that are happening on the WebAssembly world, like some projects and new specs coming up. Uh, all the demo that are uh, presented here is available on GitHub. So if you want to check the code in more details, you can just go to, to uh, that Git, Git repository and check the code. And also Jonathan and I uh, provide this Google Docs with some other links about WebAssembly, of course, and uh, WebAssembly and IoT in general. So you can definitely just uh, access that link and, and see that Google Docs that we are gonna post more content in there. But yeah, uh, th thanks everyone for joining and Jonathan and I will be here available to answer all of your questions.